question. Applies up-to-date cognitive science to human religiousness and makes a compelling case for atheism. He has, public, uh, he has been published widely in atheism, including an internet encyclopedia of philosophy entry. He writes at, sorry, I couldn't read that. He, uh, he writes a heavily visited blog at www.provingthenegative.com and he teaches one of the rare university level courses in the US on atheism. He's also a recent of two outstanding teacher awards, uh, recipient of two outstanding teacher awards at CSUS. Today, we'll be speaking on the topic of being an out of the closet atheist, being nice or being mean, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. Please help me in welcoming Matt McCormick. Exactly. How's that? Can you hear me? All right, I'll get to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X in a second. Uh, here's what I want to do today. I've been an out-of-the-closet public atheist for many years. I've written a book. I do public speaking events. I teach university courses about atheism and religion. I do events, radio interviews, podcasts, a blog, articles, encyclopedia entries, and all the like related to atheism. And I'd like to speak for my first time ever in public about being an atheist asshole. I'm going to urge you to do the same. Here's why. Uh, here's where we are. Atheists remain perhaps the most reviled minority group in American society. Uh, I can provide some empirical data on this if you're skeptical, although I don't think anybody in the room is skeptical about that. 53% report, that is 53% of Americans report that they would not vote for a well-qualified atheist presidential candidate. I'm actually surprised the number's that low. I bet there's something wrong with their poll. Uh, Americans think atheists are less likely to share their vision of society than Muslims, immigrants, and homosexuals. And that's going to be important here in a second. I'm going to come back to that. They disapprove of their children marrying atheists more often than any other group. I was stunned to find this out, including Muslims, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, or Jews. So I figure that in order to create the most possible strife at home, you should go gay, find a black Asian atheist, ex-Muslim converted to a cultural Jew partner, and take them home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Just to make things fun. Okay, so you also know this, Americans are sensitive. Just asking or, God forbid, expressing doubt or worse, denying someone's God view is considered by many to be offensive. Non-believers are accused of being angry, strident, intolerant, hostile, and aggressive. An atheist in the room is like what having a vegetarian at the dinner table with a bunch of meat eaters, meat eaters used to be. People just feel judged by your existence. In reviews of Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, and Hitchens, reviewers complain at length about the tone of the book. Not so much about the arguments, not so much about the evidence, not so much about the research, but their tone. They don't like their tone. There's this incredible uh, ABC interview with Sam Harris a couple years ago. And Harris is a very soft-spoken, mild-mannered guy, very calm, very under control. He's been this Buddhist, you know, super duper meditator for 25 years. And um, the reporter keeps asking him, why are you so angry? Why are you so strident? And Harris is just calm and relaxed and talking to him. And he keeps saying, why are you so mad at us? Why do you hate us so much? And Harris is calm and relaxed and talking like this. There's something funky going on there. I want to talk about that in a minute. Atheists, they say, need to be kinder, gentler, more warm and sympathetic in their discussions of religious beliefs. You're rubbing them the wrong way on this just by your views. You need to be nicer. Even worse, atheists are immoral. You all knew this. Um, and the most pervasive, pernicious delusion about atheism is that we aren't moral. That, and the point that we don't share their vision of society, suggests that they've written us off as being below the level of acceptable social inclusion. Uh, so, what to make of all this? Well, this is not my area of expertise. I'm a philosopher. I do arguments and debates and, and talk about reasons for God and no God and whether we should believe in the resurrection and all that. But let's talk about civil rights. Uh, there are more than a few similarities between what we're doing and what the American Civil Rights Movement, 
feminists and gay rights activists have done, and we can draw some lessons from them. Let's look at Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. They give us some guidance. Of course, Martin Luther King, here's the kind and loving voice, respect and love. We must learn to live together as brothers, to perish together as fools. And there's lots of other sort of uh, telling, compassionate um, admonitions from Martin Luther King. Of course, Malcolm X is the confrontational one, if I understand my history right. Um, a few quotes. Where do we go from here? It's either the ballot or the bullet, he's famous for having said. We want freedom now. We've got to fight until we overcome. None of this singing business. As long as you're fighting on the level of civil rights, you're under Uncle Sam's jurisdiction. I'm, I'm seeing and hearing um, Denzel Washington in my head here. Uh, you're, going to, to your, you're going to his court expecting him to correct the problem. He created the problem. He's the criminal. You don't take your case to the criminal. You take your criminal to court. And, and by far the most infamous comment from Malcolm X, the white devil's time is up. It has been for almost 50 years now. OK, so on the other side, on the more sympathetic and compassionate side, even kinder side, of course, our patron, patron saint, Carl Sagan, in the way that skepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there's a tendency to belittle, to condescend, to ignore the fact that, deluded or not, supporters of superstition and pseudoscience are human beings with real feelings who, like the skeptic, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are, in many cases, consonant with science. If their culture has not given them all the tools they need to pursue this great quest, let us temper our criticism with kindness. None of us comes fully equipped. Uh, and I feel that. I, 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 I feel the compassion, and I'm warmed by Sagan, and pretty much anything Sagan says, I'm like, OK, fine, that's great. Whatever you say. Uh, but respectfully, with great trepidation, I need to part company with Professor Sagan here for me, which for me is like a Catholic arguing with the Pope. Sometimes bullshit needs to be called bullshit. Oh, and I learned from uh, Jesse, I forget his last name. Jesse, are you here? I'm not here. This morning, uh, he cited some empirical research that says when you curse in your talks, it's more effective. Uh, which is good, because I do it all the time and I can't stop. And I was just reading my Rate, rate My Professor review, which I don't usually do. I haven't done it in years and years, because I don't give a shit. But um, <laughs> I was just reading them, and quite consistently, there were you know, 10, 20% of them complained about the foul language. Uh, so if you haven't figured it out already, this is an R-rated talk. Um, OK, so here's, here's what I want to argue. Or, or you know, I'm here with a bunch of like-minded people, people of sort of the same view. So I can't help, I can't resist the temptation but to stir things up and trouble here. Um, I'm going to maintain, despite some of the big group hug nonsense that's going on around here, that there's a vital role for defiance and antagonism that I'm going to urge you towards. Um, and here's the problem. Humans are overbelievers. The human cognitive system is prone to a long list of glitches, bizarre short circuits, unreliable quirks, brain farts, biases, and delusions. I'm going to give you just a very brief uh, truncated list of those. And the interesting fact about the way that this organ is built is that it errs in many cases, at least with regard to spiritual, magical, supernatural, religious beliefs, this organ in your head errs on the side of excess. That is, it goes too far in belief, and that's important. Now, here's just a few of the other really interesting sorts of biases, fallacies, mistakes, um, errors, framing problems that humans are guilty of. Um, and and uh, this is talked about this morning some, but the, but the two go-to books here, um, from, from my thinking, are at least uh, Daniel Kahneman and Jonathan Barron, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow and Thinking and Deciding. So there's a long list of these, but really what I want to get to about the, the various mistakes we make are some of these early ones. Hyperactive agency detector, promiscuous teleologist, overactive causal theorist, those ones are really interesting because that's where this religiousness is emerging out of this, the, the human uh, neurobiological system. I want, to, I want to think about that excessive um, error on the side of overbelief stuff now for a few minutes. I think. Um, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I think that there's really good evidence to think that we're wired to believe, wired to be religious. And I think evolution built us to be that way. Evolution might have produced cognitive systems that tend towards sparseness, underestimation, conservatism, reluctance, agnosticism, and caution about what's true or reasonable. 
try to sort of imagine those kinds of themes if they had emerged from the African savanna. That's not what happened. But imagine what they'd be like, sort of Mr. Spots or something. Um, we might have been cognitive agents who, on the whole, make their mistakes by underbelieving. That when the evidence sort of pounds you on the head, you're still like, ah, I don't know. I want to get some more evidence. I want to, I want to gather some more information. And there's a bunch of really interesting evolutionary reasons why this didn't happen. We're not like this. But I'm just trying to make the point by contrast that we're just the opposite. And that's everybody. People in this room and out of this room are built to go just the other direction. Evolution built humans to be slutty believers. Nothing, no, no offense to any sluts in the audience. <laughs> Leaping after every vague su suggestion, enthusiastically embracing every half-baked suggestion of an idea that pops into our heads, especially religious ones. We're very bad religious sluts. We are, oh, that didn't go over well at all. I thought that might go okay. We are the staggering, doxastic drunks at the party, slurring, I love all you spiritual ideas. You're just the best. Isn't it great to be religious-y, believe religious -y things? I want to go home with all of you. Maybe I've belabored the metaphor too much at this point. Um, I intend to do some drinking tonight, so I hope you all will join me, uh, by the way. OK. so. Here's what I think our problem is. At least what I think the problem is is that we're in this context. We're in this massive population of primates. The population of primates that you find yourself in is wired to adopt dangerous, delusional religious belief systems. Uh, I probably won't get much resistance from anybody in the audience on that claim either. Um, you find yourself in a particular kind of epistemic situation. You're surrounded by people, yourself included, who are prone to do this. So truth, reason, skepticism, and the scientific method, which it's, in some ways it's quite shocking and surprising that we've got a handle on it at all. They're all very, they're those concerns or those, that agenda or those um, goals are very recent inventions of human, uh, human effort, um, are in a perpetual struggle against our natural tendencies. That is, look, humans are not significantly changing from generation to generation on the big scale our cognitive natures aren't going to radically shift over the course of the next 100 or 500 or 1,000 years. You've got basically the same neurobiological system that came off of the African savanna. It's still built that way. Yet we've got the scientific method. We've got the scientific enterprise. We've got human culture in the background with all these new babies being born into it as time goes on. So there's going to be this sort of constant perpetual struggle. And I know that sometimes I hear atheists or doubters or skeptics and the like talk about um, imagine a world with no religion. Look, folks, that's not going to happen. We're not wired that way. That's like imagining a world with no wisdom teeth. I mean, it's not going to happen unless we sort of you know, surgically remove it. Ooh. Maybe that's the way to do it. OK, so um, it, it would appear that we need something like an aggressive, we need aggressive help, like a 12-step program. Um, hi, I'm Matt, and I haven't committed confirmation bias in two days. And you're all supposed to say, hi, Matt. But this morning, I did make the planning fallacy. <laughs> I actually know that I study these for a living. I teach these, and I make these routinely. I make these on a regular basis. Uh, and actually, the fact that we're in this city is even more pertinent here. Here's a city that is built to exploit a number of the glitches in the human cognitive system. Right? You've all walked through the casinos. You've seen the way the slot machines work. So think of. The religious meme, think of religious institutions, think of religion and culture as acting on humanity in the same sort of way that those machines are exploiting all those glitches and getting into the system there in Vegas. Hmm. OK, so what to say, what to move, where to go from there. Given our cognitive nature, it's often not right, I think, to be polite, let's step let stuff go, not speak up, or tiptoe considerately around people's tender religious feelings, particularly since Americans' religious feelings are so oversensitized to the slightest suggestion that there's something wrong. Uh, look, you can't fail. You can't help but offend. Your very existence, your having doubts in your head already is offensive. So let's just go there. Let's just embrace that, right? Not speaking up is actually doing them a disservice. You are the much-needed bucket of cold water, the wake-up call, the antagonistic gadfly. And here's who I'm most worried about. Like the civil rights movement and feminism and the gay rights movement, we're at the vanguard of social change for an embattled minority. 
But in some ways, this minority is different and special and more vulnerable. In some ways, they're, they're, the analogy is a bad analogy. But there's some, there's some, some uh, similarities I want to draw out. Here, the victims are getting daily attacks for their thoughts from all sides, just for thinking certain things. And I'll give you some really concrete examples in a second. And a lot of them are kids. Millions and millions of kids growing up in religious households having natural questions, natural curiosity, natural doubts, and those getting squashed, those getting suppressed, those getting oppressed, those getting um, actively uh, hounded out of them, threatened out of them by family, friends, church members, so people surrounding them. So we've got to think about them, right? They're isolated, they're scared, they're intimidated, and they're filled with self-doubt. Everybody in, the, in this room has been there, right? You were that kid in Des Moines or whatever. Just saying the stuff that she's thinking about out loud is met with scathing criticism, estrangement, threats of hell, and all sorts of other uh, opposition. For them, there's nothing more important than to see someone who's brave, defiant, and confident, open about not believing. They need to see someone who practices what Harris calls conversational intolerance. All right, so they're sort of the invisible victim. I found myself, so here's my anecdote. I don't usually like anecdotes, but uh, Jesse maybe convinced me they have some use. I find myself walking across campus, and there's that Jehovah's Witness guy again. He's there every year, and he's got his table set up, and he's got this thing, Bible questions asked and answered. And he sits there all day, every day, and people come by, and they ask him stuff, and he looks it up, and he tells them his interpretation of the Bible. So I went back to my office, and I thought, okay, I'll do this. This would be a joke. I'll put this on my door. And I was a little bit, I had some trepidation about doing it at first. But I thought, you know, you know what the hell, it's sort of, somebody will think it's cute, right? Well, little did I know that I started getting people come to my office looking for guidance. And not just looking for guidance on the philosophy, on the arguments, which I'm good at. I know all that stuff. But it was like they wanted counseling. And I'm like, fuck, I can't do therapy. So I get this mom who comes in, and she goes, my 17-year-old's an atheist. What should I do? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then I get a 17-year-old come in, and this is the real tearjerker case. He, the 17-year-old comes in, and he says, I don't know what's happened to his parents, but he says he's living with his aunt and uncle, and he's, he's having his doubts. He's having his worries about the God thing. He's being raised in this sort of fundamentalist Christian church. And uh, he's trying to talk about some of these worries and some of these concerns. And his uncle is so distraught and so aggravated and so fed up with his doubts that his uncle says, you stop bringing that stuff into my house or I'm kicking you out. You can't live here anymore. I don't want to hear any more of that in this house. And at this point, the kid's sitting in my office and he's crying. Never seen him before. He just saw that on my door and walked into my office and that was happening five minutes later. In my mind, I'm going, fuck, what do I do? Okay, those people need us. They need us. Now, maybe we don't have to go quite the violent antagonistic route that Malcolm X suggested. There's different ways for this to be manifest, right? But maybe it's going to manifest, well, in the gay rights movement, it's sort of the equivalent of, of, a, of a gay pride parade with drag queens who are all outrageous and flamboyant, right? So we need, this is a room full of drag queens. That's what we need, right? And well, here's what I'm suggesting, that the compassionate kind, sensitive, tiptoe, careful route might not be so expedient. I want you to have both tools, at least in your tool bag. I realize I'm talking to campus organizers, and being polite, sensitive, compassionate can go a long way towards facilitating intellectual and social progress. And you might well gather more students into your groups by being that. But look, here's the thing. We want to get from A to B. What's A and what's B here? Point A is where we are now, and point B is a society where A, reasonable, thoughtful, defeasible atheism is more widespread. Reasonable, thoughtful, defeasible religiousness is more widespread. I don't know if I'll get much sympathy on that, but I actually would consider that to be a, a, a remarkable bit of progress. And I actually think that American culture has made a good bit of progress on this front. Not to think about that. But I think that would be a, a, a kind of progress that we could help facilitate. 
And furthermore, people who are surrounded by oppressive religiousness feel freer and safer to entertain their doubts, abandon the beliefs of their parents and neighbors. It's those kids who are feeling the weight of that religious oppressiveness around them that I'm most worried about. Malcolm X clearly saw this. The shortest distance between A and B requires that a lot of us stand up, be defiant, call it out, and let the sleepers know that they aren't alone. That will come off as rude, arrogant, abrasive, and intolerant, because short of outright physical oppression, that's the mechanism of resistance to social change. That is, when you've got a bunch of primates together, that's short of, short of the big alpha male in the primate troop beating the crap out of one of the lesser minor males, and it being a physical confrontation, it's social mechanisms that are used to keep people in line. So that's, I think, I'm sort of you know, uh, speculating off the cuff here about an evolutionary account, but I think that's where that weird inversion is coming from, where you're just having doubts is considered to be rude or inoffensive or, offensive or intolerant or something, right? That's, that's this thing, this, this method of social uh, control exerting itself. OK, so let me wrap it up. Um, lest I be uh, misunderstood, I had this little nightmare about this headline. University professor incites atheists to riot. That's not exactly what I'm after. Don't get me wrong, I don't think I'm telling you to go do anything illegal or even immoral, although we can talk about the details. Um, but defiance, resistance, noisy protest, confrontation, and intolerance, at least conversational style, are legitimate, expedient, and effective tools of social change. Sometimes they get from A to B better, faster, more effectively, and sometimes they do more good that way. See, I told you I'm an asshole. Ain't it?